early hours of the morning, long, long before the streets are aired. But London's river is fully awake. The small river tugs are proudly towing the heavily laden barges to their destinations in all parts of Dockland. Ah, oh, yes, the old River Thames is still doing its share of transport for the capital's commercial undertaking. Beside this proud and mighty stretch of liquid history, the less fortunate of us pass away the dark hours. In a short time, slumbers will be disturbed, and once again we shall be on our way. Daylight, and still the moon is in the sky, but gradually it's sinking to give way to the sun, herald of another day. While one of the early trams crosses Blackfriars Bridge, the last of the day's fruit and vegetable supply is quickly approaching its goal, Covent Garden. Here, right in the centre of London, work has been in progress throughout the night. Potatoes from Brittany, Apples from South Africa, tulips from the Finlands, nuts from Brazil. In fact, every kind of fruit, flower and vegetable from the English countryside, from the empire, and from all parts of the world finds its way to London's largest market. It's a hive of activity. Soon the market will be full of buyers from the small local tradesmen to the representatives of huge multiple stores. And whether the purchase is large or small, each is given his due attention. Flowers are arranged. Peas are sifted. And a hundred of other odd jobs are done while the office boys, the typists, and commentators are still rubbing their eyes. A steady stream of people crossing a bridge that was deserted only an hour ago. From the suburbs come the trains, bringing hundreds of thousands of London's toilers who prefer half an hour or an hour's journey each day to living in the smoke, the grime and noise of a great city. So the crowds increase. Not everybody comes by train, however, but in recent years, blocks of flats have risen all over the metropolis and its immediate outskirts. In such a building, another day is beginning. No different from yesterday, or tomorrow, or a hundred other days, except that it's, well, it's today. Who knows what it'll bring? For you? For her, for him. Or for anyone. Fresh hopes, fresh worries, love, laughter or tears. Another day has begun. It's a day that's to play a big part in the life of little Jill, and of her mistress. Nine o'clock delivery. Just having his morning cup of tea. Tush, tush. What do you think of your master, Tommy? 
Huh? You're no better. By now, London's office workers, always the last to arrive, are streaming to their work by foot, by bus and tube. Terminal station, train after train is arriving, packed with thousands of people coming to the source of their livelihood in the metropolis. And still they come. Streaming past the barriers. The greatest crush is in the city itself. More bank clerks, typists, more office workers are employed here than anywhere else in this great big cockeyed world. Back at the flats, away from the crowded thoroughfares, our little pug-nosed Jill is allowed to roam in the square. While her mistress prepares for the day. And at the same time, on the other side of the square... Trafalgar Square. The paradise of London's pigeons, their favorite playground, where they're certain of a feed from passers-by and visitors who stop to watch and wonder at their cheekiness and lack of fear. Unlike her mistress, dignified Jill considers these birds unworthy of her interest. But then... I could get at those goofy looking birds, I'd make their feathers fly. But say, there's Jill. Have a heart, boss. What a game Master Tommy would have had with this lot. But 
the boss is taking no risks. By now it's nearly midday and radiating from Piccadilly Circus, the main streets of the West End, Haymarket, Regent Street and Shaftesbury Avenue, the mecca of Theatreland, are thronged with shoppers, pedestrians and vehicles, controlled alike by traffic signals and fixed crossings. The lights flash red and people in their hundreds cross safely. flash green and people cross anyway. The waiting cars are away. The onflow of traffic is resumed from all directions. And then more pedestrians. And still more cars. Pedestrians again and on and on and on. Right in the hub of an empire's capital, we find the shoeshine man busily at work. But he's not alone in his glory. For many years, under the statue of Eros, flower girls have sold their violets, their heather and roses. In fact, Piccadilly Circus, Eros and the flower girls are united into one memory in the minds of most people. immediately beneath the heart of London extends the most amazing station in the world, itself the center of the largest and most elaborate network of tube and underground railways ever constructed by man. Through this station pass more than 1,600 trains in one day. And during the peak period, as many as 130 pass in one hour. The number of passengers using Piccadilly Circus Station exceeds 100,000 in a single day, and in the rush hours, they stream through at the rate of 25,000 an hour. Count them. Fast-moving staircases carry the crowds to and from the bowels of the earth. In this station, there is more than a quarter of a mile of these moving staircases. Escalators, in themselves a marvel of modern invention and engineering. Hello, here's Tommy and the boss again. I wonder what Tommy thinks of these rabbit warrants. And meanwhile, upstairs, people are taking their tickets. And amongst them... No luck, Tommy. No, she's going in the wrong direction again. Oh, you'll have to do something about this. Ah, here's his chance. And he's taking it.
What? No ticket. And you'll have to hurry if you want to catch that dog of yours. Come on, Tommy. Well, well, every dog has his day. has made it. Now for explanation, if she'll listen. She does. You know, it does seem a long story, but then... Uh, what? Still explaining? I wonder. Surely he can't still be explaining. Now, uh, watch this, folks. See that? Somewhere in this little tale of ours, there's a moral. I wonder what it can be. Ah, yes, that's it. Two's company. <laughs> 